Hey, Bias Pixel. I want to know more about the villains of Kamen Rider Kuga. Sure thing, but I do need to warn you that this discussion will cover a lot of spoilers. With that said, let's get started. So we've discussed that the monsters in Kamen Rider Kuga are referred to as the unidentified life forms by the police and the media in the show. However, a bit later in the series, it's revealed that the monsters are actually members of an ancient tribe known as the Grungi, who developed their cultures around fighting and killing. It's also revealed that we are the descendants of the tribe, Rinto, who developed their cultures by maintaining peace. To stop the Grungi's killings, one of the Rinto warriors used the powers of Kuga to seal them away. However, the university research group broke the seal which led to the revival of the Grungi at the beginning of this show. Okay, so ancient tribal rivalry is at play here. So I'm assuming that the Gnongi are killing the Linto to claim the world as their own. Well, that's actually not the case. The Gnongi are killing the Linto because, for them, it's a game. The reason why the murders follow a specific pattern is because there are rules that the Gnongi have to follow. Honestly, I'm kind of disappointed to hear that. I was intrigued by the monsters because they sounded so mysterious, but now that I know that they're just killing people as part of a game, they just sound like typical villains for evil for evil's sake. Well, let me first say that even though the word game is used in the show to refer to the murders, I think that term undermines how important it is to the Grungi. For them, succeeding in the game is their only goal in life. The Grungi show how powerful they are through the performance, and the results directly affect the member status in the tribe. It's so important and sacred to them that I think it's better to think of the games as rituals instead. I see, unlike the typical villains, the Gorongi have concrete values and beliefs then. Yep, and to emphasize the culture aspect of Gorongi, they even have their own language. When the show began, the Gorongi spoke strictly in their native tongue, so the viewers didn't understand what they were saying. It's only until later that they start learning to speak Japanese to uh, presumably better assimilate into Japanese society. In regards to this, I need to warn you that the subtitles on Shout Factory translated all of the Grungi language, so you're going to understand some dialogues that you're not originally supposed to, and it might ruin some elements of surprise. Oh, okay, well I guess I'll gotta keep that in mind when I watch Kamen Rider Kuga, but it's really cool that the show actually made up a whole language. Yeah, and if you end up liking the show a lot, then you can read up on how the Grungi language was made. I'm not gonna go into detail, but it's based off of a simple encryption of the Japanese alphabet, and it's actually easily decipherable. I was initially a bit disappointed when I heard that the murders were just a game, but I do like hearing how much thought was put into the Grungi's culture. Okay, I think I get the general characteristics of the Grungi. Uh, how about we get into the key villains of this show? Sure, uh, let me explain about the Grungi's ranking system first. The hierarchy of the tribe is, for the most part, based on how well the members have performed in the murder game. From bottom to top, the ranking goes from Zu, Me, and Go. The best player will be awarded a special rank. Mm. The ranking does not reset and there are already players on the higher ranks based on their performance in the ancient times. There is also a special group, Ra, that works as the moderators of the game. I suppose I'll choose a character from each group who I consider to be the most memorable and explain about them. Let's start with the lowest rank, Zu, which the murder game starts off with. The role for this rank is simple and they need to successfully kill the number of people specified by the moderators of Ra within a certain time limit. I definitely think the most memorable character from this rank is Unidentified Lifeform number 3, Zu Goma Gu. Goma transforms into a bat monster and always wears a long coat because he's weak to sunlight. He looks creepy. Oh yeah, I love how overly expressive Goma is as an intimidating creep. But in actuality, Goma is quite pathetic. Based on the reviews that I've read, there were fans of the show who even saw him as a comedy character. An interesting thing about Goma is that he never got to participate in the game for um, unknown reasons. Oh really? Huh? He just never got the chance? A popular theory is that Goma was disqualified for killing several people before the game had officially started. However, there are other Grongi who have killed people outside of the game, but no one seemed to care or reprimand that player. So the fact of the matter is, Goma never got to participate in the game for not much of a good reason. 
now I need to inform you that the players in Zoo are generally looked down upon and treated unfairly by players in the higher ranks. However, Goba gets treated worse compared to anyone else. Considering that there are a lot of scenes where Goma annoys others and gets smacked for it, I think it's quite possible that he was excluded from the game simply because no one liked him. Yeah, well, I'm starting to feel bad for this guy. Well, just remind yourself that he has killed quite a few people in the show. Later on, Goma actually gains an extreme power-up out of coincidence by stealing and absorbing a piece of the belt that belonged to the strongest Grongi, hmm? Dagba Zeba. However, even with all of the power-up, he was killed by Dagba who wanted the belt piece back. Let's move on to the next rank, Meh. Instead of La telling them the number of people to kill, Meh declares their own number and time limit. Huh, can't the players just set an easy goal for themselves then? Well the thing is, I don't think they can. The Gurongi's life goal is to succeed in the game and go up the rank. For the Gurongi, the rank symbolizes power. I don't think the player and the other Gurongi will accept an easy goal because they wouldn't want someone weak and lacking in pride to be in the higher ranks. Anyways, I think the most memorable Gurongi from Meh was unidentified life form number 36, Meh Garima Ba, who can transform into a praying mantis monster. I don't think she's narratively that important, but she is famous among the Japanese fans for her murders. The goal of her game is, within 18 hours, kill all 288 passengers that rode the train on the Sobu line going to Chiba Prefecture whom she marked with the smoke of an incense by cutting their heads off with a giant scythe by following specific steps. Um, that sounds extremely complicated. Well, don't worry about it for now. I'll explain during the ghost segment as to why her role is so complicated compared to everyone else in Meh. Anyways, what made Garima famous is her murder method. Garima approaches the target, instantly cuts through their neck with her sight, proceeds to walk away, and tells the target to don't look back. When the target looks back, their head slides off. Oh jeez, that's scary. But how was the target able to move even after she cut through the neck? That's because Garima's scythe is so sharp that everything in the neck stays intact until the target applies an extra force to it by looking back which leads to the head being severed. Uh, that's gruesome. I think I should tell you that the head sliding off is only implied through the sound effects. The scenes are quite scary, but there is no blood gushing out or anything. But yeah, I personally loved how intense and scary her episodes were because one of her targets was Sakurako, who was saved by Yusuke in the neck of time. Uh, just move on already. Fine. Let's move on to the next rank, Go. The players in Go are extremely powerful, but their murder games require a lot of restrictions. Similar to Meh, the players of gold declare the number of people to kill in the time limit. On top of this, the player must use a weapon and they also have to add additional restrictions of some kind to their murder. Didn't Garima's murder have a lot of restrictions just like this? That's because as the strongest player in Meh, Garima was preparing herself to play as a gold. That's why she used the scythe and also restricted the targets to the people who rode the train with her. The other players in Med didn't play a game that was as complicated as hers. Ganima, however, didn't have the ability that the players in Go had, which is the ability to morph their weapons. The players in Go can change the size of their weapons for easy concealment and even morph a completely different item into their own weapon. Ganima didn't learn this ability yet and had to carry around a giant scythe, which made it blatantly obvious to Yusuke and the police that she's a Grongi even if she was walking around in her human form. Anyways, let's talk about the key player in Go. It was difficult for me to choose because there are so many memorable characters in this rank, but if I were to choose one, then I'll go with unidentified life form number 42, Go Jarajita, who can transform into a porcupine monster. Porcupine, eh? Well, that sounds kinda cute. Well, I would like you to know that Jaraji is known for the most disturbing murders in the show, and is narratively important as the only Gurogi who used to kill out of hatred. Okay, never mind about porcupines being cute. So, what was this guy's murder game? The goal of Jaraji's game is, within 12 days, kill all 90 male students of the second year of Mirorikawa High School by putting a small quill into their brains which will enlarge after 4 days. Ugh, nope, nope, 
<laughs> just hearing that is disturbing. Oh yeah, the episodes that he appears in were scary. They definitely had elements of horror films. His episodes are one of my favorites from the show. And I think they did a great job portraying a tragic situation in which communication is impossible and violence is the ultimate answer. Well, I get that he's done horrible things, but that applies to the other Grundy too, right? What made him tick off Yusti so much? It's basically Jaraji's sadistic tendencies to toy with the targets by unnecessarily making them panic-stricken. Even though other Grundy have shown signs of enjoying their hunt, Jaraji's actions were particularly malicious and insidious to the point which one of his targets committed suicide. Yusuke felt overwhelming anger and hatred toward Jaraji, which actually triggered him to eventually gain his final form, but I'll cover it a little bit later. For now, let me finish talking about the last two important Grongi that are left. One of them is unidentified lifeform B1, La Barbade, who is also known as the woman with rose tattoo. She was basically the one who was in charge of moderating all of the games. Throughout the show, Baruba was presumably a rose monster, but she never transformed fully into her monster form. Apparently, she wasn't supposed to be a special grongi, but the script writers changed their minds because the actress did a fantastic job with portraying a mysterious character. I really like Baruba, and I think she's the one who made grongi seem intellectual and enigmatic. I think the most important thing about her is her comments throughout the show regarding Linto becoming more like the Grongi, as she observed the police getting more powerful weapons that eventually became strong enough to kill a Grongi in their monster form. This parallels Yusuke who gradually stepped closer to turning into a stronger killing machine. Her comments direct their viewers' attention to the tragic situation of how violence brought in by the Grongi brought out an even greater violence out of the Linto. Finally, let's cover the strongest Grongi, hmm? Dagba Zeba, or otherwise known as Unidentified Lifeform Number 0. The monster form is apparently based on a stag beetle, just like Kuga. The human form for him looks like a nice guy. Well, don't let his looks deceive you because his smile portrays his pure love for violence. Dagba is the amalgamation of everything that Yusuke despises. Dagba loves killing people and will fight only for his own smile. He is definitely famous for the final fight between him and Yusuke. Seriously, that fight is legendary because it went against entertaining portrayal of battle scenes. So uh, is it boring or something? Oh no, far from it. What I mean by entertaining portrayal is a fight scene in which the viewers rejoice and cheer for the hero. In Kuga, there is no joy in the fight. The scene depicts violence simply as a brutal act while two young men attempt to kill each other. I love the scene where both of their transformations wear off and Yusuke and Dagba fight as humans. Yusuke cries as he punches Dagba while Dagba smiles and laughs as he punches back. It's a great scene. Well, this sounds intense. By the way, you said there's something about Ikuga's final form. Oh right, uh, well now that you understand about the Gurongi, let me explain about Kuga which the police and the media refer to as Unidentified life form number 4. The important thing is that Kamen Rider Kuga basically has the same abilities as the Kurongi. Kuga can morph items into various weapons depending on the form he is in. For example, when he is in the blue form, he could change anything that's thin and long into a staff weapon. Likewise, he could change a gun into a crossbow in the green form and thin objects into a sword in the purple form. His final form is the black form which was triggered by hatred toward Jaraji as we mentioned earlier. This form requires Yusuke to have a strong determination to kill someone, and could potentially change him into an emotionless killing machine. Now let me go on a tangent for a little bit. I recently watched parts of an interview with the former crew members during World War II of the Japanese warship Yukikaze. One of the veterans stated that when he was faced with imminent death from the enemy planes attacking the ship, he realized that his fear turned into the desire to kill. And then, he realized that he felt pleasure from pulling the trigger of his machine gun. The veteran stated that him feeling joy from trying to kill his enemies was the most frightening moment he ever experienced during the war. Oh wow, uh, I don't even know what to say. Uh, what made you decide on checking out that interview? Japan commemorates the end of World War II on August 15th, so I randomly stumbled upon someone's post about it recently while I read my daily news. 
Anyways, I just wanted to bring this up because I thought that Kuga's final form illustrated what was stated in the interview. Kuga's final form had a risk of changing Yusuke into someone like Daguba or any of the other Gurongi who enjoys murder because the black form required a strong desire to kill. However, the existence of Ichijo and the police saved Yusuke. As I said in the previous discussion, Ichijo is the hope of Yusuke. Even from the very beginning, Ichijo helped Yusuke fight against the Gurongi. If Yusuke had fought all alone throughout the show, then he eventually could have been crushed by his own hatred and anger. This didn't happen because Ichijo always had his back and was a constant reminder that everyone is fighting against the situation together. Right before the final battle, Yusuke told Ichijo that he was glad that he met him and was able to change it to the black form without losing himself, which was clearly indicated by his eyes staying red. Instead of fighting with violent emotion and desire to kill, he fought with a sense of duty just like Ichijo in order to protect everyone's smile. And with the defeat of Daguba, the story of Yusuke as Comrade Kuga ends. Oh dang, that's an impressive story. Oh by the way, I found a great interpretation on a Japanese forum that I would like to share. I was wondering about why Ichijo's name and Yusuke's last name, Godai, had numbers in it and was looking through to some forums for answers. The interpretation that I came across stated that because Kuga, unidentified life form number 4, fought together with Ichijo, he was able to fight Daguba as a human, as Yusuke Godai. Oh man, the feels. I love this interpretation. Well, as a guy who hasn't watched the show yet, um, all I'm gonna say is uh, that's clever, I guess? Well, hopefully you'll appreciate it as much as I can someday. Anyways, I just want to warn you that fun of this show is a little bit different from the other Kamen Rider series. If you want suspense and heavy storytelling, then it's great. But it's not a good choice if you want stylish, fun actions. And as a reminder, you can watch the entire show officially for free on Shout Factory's website. Okay, I'll check it out someday. Alrighty, Bias Pixel, I'll see you soon. Take care. You too. See ya!